Hello and a very warm welcome to our latest edition of our stories from the Strong Rooms. This month we'll look at Hull's post-war years from 1945 to 1951. But before we begin, if you're new to this channel, remember to subscribe and click that little bell icon so that you're sure not to miss out whenever a new video is released. Okay, now that the admin's out of the way, let's dive in. During the Second World War, by virtue of Kingston-upon-Hull's geographical position, the city proved easily identifiable and an accessible target for enemy bombers. Houses, factories, port installations, commercial premises, public buildings and places of recreation and entertainment were seriously damaged and destroyed, and the shopping centre was almost completely eliminated. Out of 90,000 dwelling houses in the city before the war, it is estimated that 84,000 were damaged in some form or another. At the end of the war, the city's life was at an extremely low ebb, with desolation everywhere and morale dangerously low. The story of Kingston-upon-Hull's wartime ordeal is matched only by the story of its post-war fight back to prosperity. Prior to the war, the population of Kingston-upon-Hull had been 318,000, but dropped significantly to around 200,000 during the war. Those who left the city in service or as evacuees made a gradual return home, some not returning for two or more years after the war had ended. Many had lost their lives and a number of memorials began to be planned and erected in the city. By February 1946, 1,897 prisoners of war, men and women from German, Italian and Japanese camps had returned to Hull. To celebrate their safe return, three functions were held at the Maidley Street Bath in February 1946. Approximately 500 ex-prisoners of war attended each occasion, and so that they could meet up with fellow comrades, the events were arranged according to the camps they were held in. Entertainment included conjurers, a victory celebration film, and community singing. A light orchestra played during the meal, and 1,500 cigarettes with 72 gallons of beer were laid on to aid the celebrations. Almost 38,000 children had been evacuated from Hull. Orphans at the Newland Orphanage were also evacuated and sent to Pateley Bridge for the duration of the war. It wasn't until July 1946, however, that Operation Newland began, and the first 20 children returned to the Trinity House home under the care of Mr and Mrs Hobbs. They were welcomed home by the Lord Mayor and Lady Mayoress, the Sheriff and his lady, together with the President and members of the House Committee, and celebrated with tea and cake. Over the following few months, boys returned in groups to take up residence in the different homes at Newland. The girls, however, had to wait until 1947 before they could return, as the corporation still occupied two of the girls' homes and repair work was necessary before their return. Air raid shelters had provided protection and saved many lives during enemy air attacks. Once the war had ended, however, they were no longer needed for that purpose. At the end of the war, households who had received an Anderson shelter were expected to remove their shelters and local authorities began the task of reclaiming the corrugated iron. Householders who wished to keep their shelter, or more likely the valuable metal it was made from, could pay a nominal fee but had to do so before 31st of May 1947, when the sale of steel shelter material ceased. Shelters on corporation estates were subject to more rigorous rules, with all shelters having to conform to building bylaws, most notably that a shelter had to be positioned at least 15 feet from the rear wall of a house and that all shelters at the side of a house and near a window had to be removed. Many residents felt it unjust that the corporation was to remove the shelters from their gardens, particularly as they had become accustomed to using them as much needed storage. Just under 1,800 people in corporation properties applied to keep their domestic air raid shelter. Due to difficulties importing food to Britain during the Second World War, rationing was introduced to the nation in January 1940. In order to ensure that everyone received an equal amount of food, every person received a ration book, which they had to take with them to the shops and get the items they bought crossed off by the shopkeeper. Rationing was not limited only to food, of course. Restrictions were also placed on fuel and clothing. Rationing continued for many years after the end of hostilities, and some aspects of it became stricter for some years afterwards. 
The Ministry of Food controlled the distribution of food during and in the immediate years after the war and was responsible for providing information on food rationing as well as giving advice on the use of all foods. Most people had been grateful to the Ministry for its work during the war years as it had helped people make the most of the restricted foods available. However, a year or so after the war had ended, people began to feel disenchanted by the Ministry's advice and wanted restrictions to be lifted and rationing to end as quickly as possible. It wasn't until July 4th, 1954, that meat was derationed and food rationing finally came to an end. After the Second World War, Hull, like other heavily bombed cities, was desperately short of housing and the labour to build permanent homes. Before the end of the war, the government realised that an urgent solution had to be found. Envisaged by wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the Housing Temporary Accommodation Act of 1944 aimed to provide large numbers of houses quickly and economically. The Ministry of Works designed a prototype which was not developed but invited competitive designs based upon it. The principle was that their individual parts could be prefabricated in bulk in factories elsewhere, moved to site and then efficiently and relatively quickly constructed using semi-skilled labour. Eleven manufacturers received official approval. In Hull, three designs of prefabricated bungalows were chosen by the Hull Corporation and were constructed on more than 30 sites across the city. Robert Greenwood Tarrant's patented design was the most prevalent in the city, totalling 1,314 examples, and was manufactured in Hull by Tarrant Industries Limited. They were distinguished by their well-known pebble dash finish and living room corner window, which you can see here. The aluminium, on the other hand, was designed by the Aircraft Industries Research Organisation on Housing and produced in factories no longer engaged in airplane construction. As the name suggests, they were made of flat aluminium wall panels, they were bonded onto foam concrete and were distinguished by their cream colour and square windows. 725 examples were erected in the city. And finally, 418 Arcon prefabs were erected in Hull, which was the only prefab to have the living room at the rear of the property, with a picture window and French door to the back garden. The average cost of building a prefab was £1,100, which at that time was more than the cost of a permanent brick-built house. The prefab design was a triumph of space planning and for most would have seemed like a luxury compared with the poor housing conditions still in existence at the time. Each bungalow had two bedrooms, a living room, hallway, fitted kitchen with hot and cold running water, a cooker and built-in refrigerator, a fitted bathroom including an indoor lavatory and had a generous private garden. The first 100 prefabs completed in the country outside of London under the Temporary Accommodation Act were situated on Hopewell Road in Hull. Originally prefab bungalows had a planned life of just 10 years but many stood the test of time and were occupied far beyond their original expiry dates, some still being occupied to this day. By 31st of May 1948, all of Hull's 2,457 prefabs had been let. Homes had also been found for just 394 people in permanent houses. 1,015 had been given relet houses, 519 into requisitioned houses, and 60 were even placed in converted army huts. This totaled 4,445 people rehoused but there were still over 12,000 remaining applicants. It would be many years before everyone was accommodated. Following the widespread destruction in Hull during the Second World War, the services of two town planners, Sir Edwin Lutyens and Sir Patrick Abercrombie, were secured to draw up a reconstruction plan for the city. Better known as the Abercrombie Plan, it held community planning at the heart of its proposals, putting forward the concept of creating subdivided communities with the intention to reduce the population in the city centre by moving 54,000 from inner city slums to modern estates, complete with local amenities and schools. The plan also proposed to build new industrial and green belts, a new railway station, specialised pedestrian-only shopping precincts, and among the more radical ideas, proposed the building of a satellite town for 60,000 people at Burton Constable, 
as well as the flattening of large parts of the city centre and the old town. Opposed by politicians and local business figures and with contributing factors including a lack of funding and a shortage of building materials after the war, the majority of the Abercrombie Plan was not implemented. If the Abercrombie Plan had gone ahead, our city would look very different today. A number of temporary premises were set up for city centre shops that had suffered bomb damage during the war, enabling them to keep trading, although often on a smaller scale. After the war, many businesses had to wait a number of years before new permanent premises were built and ready to move into. It took five years of negotiations, for example, before the way was cleared for Hammonds to rebuild their city centre store. Before the war, it employed nearly 800 staff and had a rateable value of £5,000. The temporary premises provided 47 of their departments, but with only 20% of the former floor space. A £400,000 development saw Hammonds move back to the old premises on Paragon Square. Regeneration and the redevelopment of the city was indeed a slow process, primarily owing to limited funding and building materials. Not wishing to rely solely on future planning to provide attractive streets, Floral decorations were arranged at important crossings, flower boxes placed on public buildings in the city centre, and even in the rebuilding and extension of factories, industrialists cooperated by providing sufficient space for green verges. The aim was to ensure that in the city, the stigma of the dark satanic mills was removed forever. Despite building materials being in short supply, the council recognised that sport and recreation would play a major role in boosting morale and so encouraged the redevelopment of parks and sports grounds. Eager to return to supporting their local teams, when the Hull Daily Mail carried appeals from both Hull FC and Hull Kingston Rovers for help to buy kits, fans were more than willing to help by donating their spare clothing coupons. Hull City AFC had hoped to move into their new ground at Boothbury Park but having been used by the Home Guard during the war, including the use of tanks, meant that the pitch was in a sorry state. The opening match eventually took place on 31st of August 1946 against Lincoln City. The result? A goalless draw. After the war, entertainment proved as popular as ever. The Hull Philharmonic Orchestra began their first post-war season on 30th of November 1945 at the Queen's Hall. The hall was packed and the Hull Daily Mail reported that scores of disappointed concertgoers were turned away. The Hull New Theatre had opened in October 1939. At the start of the war, increased building costs in order to finish the project had led to huge losses. By 1950, however, the theatre had proved its popularity. It was now in profit and was sold to the Whitehall Theatre Limited for £78,000. Dancing was also a very popular pastime. The council converted a Second World War first aid post in East Park into a ballroom, which opened on New Year's Eve in 1948. The Ministry of Fuel gave permission for the premises to be heated, and there was an event on most nights of the week. In the summer of 1951, the Festival of Britain was celebrated throughout the United Kingdom. It was organised by the government to give the British a feeling of recovery in the aftermath of war and to promote the British contribution to science, technology, industrial design, architecture and the arts. The festival exhibition opened in Hull at the City Hall on Saturday the 19th of May. During that week, for one shilling entrance fee, visitors could see many of the products of Hull factories and follow the story of wool, recalling its role in making Hull Britain's third port as early as the 13th century. The story was complete through daily sheep shearing demonstrations by champion East Riding farmers to demonstrations of weaving the wool into patterns and the making of dresses and coats to finally the wearing of the garments as displayed by models in a parade which concluded the demonstrations. As part of the festival celebrations, Hull was also visited by the HMS Campania, an aircraft carrier of the Royal Navy that saw service during the Second World War. It had been converted to a floating exhibition hall for the Festival of Britain. Berthed at number three key, King George Dock, the Campania effectively offered a replica of the London South Bank exhibition and consisted of displays for agriculture and other industries, 
including coal, steel, power and transport, and included a complete radar unit on which visitors were able to watch ships moving in the Humber. The Campania docked in 10 cities and visitor numbers reached almost 900,000, with just under 88,000 of those people visiting while the ship was docked at Hull. On the 1st of May 1951, a ceremony was held to lay stones to commemorate and celebrate the construction of Festival House, which was the first new permanent building to be erected in the centre of the city since the 1941 Blitz. During the post-war years, Kingston-upon-Hull not only survived but made solid progress. Repairs to damaged dwellings, temporary housing and a vigorous post-war building programme made up for wartime losses and new housing demands were steadily met. As the population returned to the city, the City Council encouraged the reconstruction of public buildings and places of recreation and entertainment. The rivers Hull and Humber, which had contributed to the city's vulnerability during wartime, proved its strength in times of peace as its geographical location ensured that Hull remained one of Britain's great ports and aided the city's industrial and commercial endeavours. All of this enabled Kingston-upon-Hull's remarkable post-war recovery. Thank you so much for joining me on this speedy caper through Hull's post-war years and its fight back to prosperity. If you enjoyed this talk, remember to subscribe to our channel where you can find more narratives of Hull's history found within our collections here at the Hull History Centre. Until next time, thank you for listening. Bye.